Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Okay, let's get started. So um, any questions, any problems anybody wants to look at um, at the beginning today? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start then on chapter 10, which is gases. And, um, and then we'll move right along. Okay, still got a couple people joining. All righty, so let's talk about gases. This is chapter 10. Good morning. Good morning. So what we're gonna look at are some properties of gases. Gases are um, somewhat unique in terms of their behavior. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case and what those unique behaviors are. So let's begin by talking about the three primary states of matter that are found in nature. There are solids. liquids and gases. Now, these two types of matter are often referred to as condensed, condensed forms of matter. And really what that means is they're pretty dense. The atoms or the molecules are pretty close to each other. Huh. Okay. Um, so when we think about a solid, the atoms or the molecules are really close to each other. They're right on top of each other. And they are pretty rigid. So imagine a piece of metal. If you push on the metal, the whole metal will slide across the table, but you can't make the atoms move with respect to each other. So it doesn't smear out very easily. So that's a solid. Liquids are also pretty dense. They're condensed as well. So the atoms are all near each other, but they're able to move around, right? Liquids can move. So if you pour, some liquid out of a out of a glass, what will happen? The atoms will spread out across the surface of the table. So they're movable, right? So there's there's a mobility that liquids have that solids do not. Gases, on the other hand, are not considered condensed. The atoms are very far apart from each other. Really extremely far apart on average. Now, one thing that's also different about gases is that the atoms are moving around more rapidly in gases than they are in liquids or solids. So they're in motion. So I'll draw these little arrows to indicate the directions that these atoms are moving. Okay. And what we know about gases is that in general, the motion is pretty random. They're moving not in any particular direction, but all over the place. Okay, so random motion. And then we would say this is a very lower density. And these two are higher density. So just to kind of give you some numbers, let's think about water, for example, or ice. Ice, the density of ice is like 0.95 grams per milliliter. The density of water, liquid water, is only a little bit more than that, it's about 1.0. So ice and water are pretty close in density, ice a little bit lower. But if you look at um, gases, gases are typically 0 0.001 grams per milliliter. 
This is one one thousandth that of ice or of liquid water. So very low densities that we talk about with gases. Okay. So they have some different properties that we'll take a look at. So how do we consider gases? What we're going to do is when we talk about gases, we're going to talk about pressure. That'll be the first thing we talk about, P. We'll talk about volume, V, temperature, T, and then we'll also talk about moles. And the symbol we're going to use for moles is N. Okay. These are the four kind of variables that we use to measure the properties of gases. So these are variables, meaning they can change, that we use to measure the properties of gases, okay? And, you know, you think about it, we talked a lot about moles in chapter three and a little bit in chapter four and even a little bit in chapter five. We talked about temperature and temperature changes in chapter five, right? In um, chapter four we and three and four, we talked about density and volume. So volume we talked about and now pressure, well, we talked a little bit about that when we were dealing with um, the gas piston. We'll come back to the gas piston in this chapter as well. So it's not that, it's not a bad idea to kind of consider it this way. When, when, when you do any of these problems with gases, sort of your starting point is to draw a container, right? And the container typically is gonna be a cylinder Right, so, you know, a coffee cup is a cylinder. So something like that. But now we're gonna confine the gas to this cylinder. So all these little gas molecules are inside this cylinder. And then we'll put a little lid on the gas. But remember this lid is a piston. So the lid is movable sometimes. So sometimes, sometimes the lid is movable. Not always. I don't think I spelled movable right. Movable. Okay. And it'll become apparent when you do the problems whether it's movable or not. But generally what we do is we say the following. The gas is contained to a certain space, and we're going to call this the volume. The volume is the amount of space that the gas is occupying, right? And the temperature is going to be something we use a thermometer for, right? We'll stick a thermometer in there, and that will give us the temperature. Okay? And we looked at, in Chapter 5, some problems where temperatures can change, right? Delta T. Sometimes we do that in here, too. Sometimes we don't. Okay, so that's temperature, volume. Now, what about pressure? Pressure is what we're going to talk about first. Okay, so I'll go into that next. But in general, there are ways to measure pressure. So what we'll think of is the pressure is there's some force pushing down on this lid. Okay, so there's a force pushing down. You know what a force is, right? A force is is how hard you're pushing on something or how hard you're pulling on something. In general, with gases, we think of a force as being pushing as opposed to pulling, okay? There's no pulling forces going on. It's just pushing, okay? So there's some force pushing down on this lid or this piston. And what happens is the gas molecules are colliding with that lid on the other side so imagine these things are all bouncing around. They're moving real rapidly. Boom, hit, 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 hit. If enough of them hit that lid over a period of time, they'll push the lid up. So there's also a force upward pushing up. Okay. And so what we do is we say the following. 
in general, the force of the gas is equal to the force pushing down. And that force pushing down is called the external force. External meaning outside. Okay? And this is the internal force. So imagine it as opposing forces. For those of you that have taken biology classes, you learn a lot about this thing called homeostasis, which is the idea that there are opposing forces occurring in nature, in a cell, for example. So you have ions that are trying to get in, you have ions that are trying to get out, you get this sort of balance occurring, right? Well, the same is true with a gas. You've got this force pushing down on the gas, trying to make it smaller, but the gas is pushing back against that external force, trying to get bigger. So if those two forces are equal, you've now got a balance here. You can test this with a balloon. If you have a balloon that's inflated and you push on the outside, you can make that um, balloon get smaller, right? You can push in on it, but you will feel the opposing force. You'll feel the gas molecules trying to push your finger back. Eventually you'll quit pushing because you'll get tired of pushing. And that's because the gas is just continuously pushing back and eventually it will wear you down, okay? So opposing forces. Now, the term that we use is pressure, not forces, but they are directly proportional to each other. The pressure is related to the amount of force. And we'll talk a little bit more about pressure now, okay? So volume, how much space the gas occupies. Temperature, you know, how hot the gas is. Moles, how much of the gas is in there and then pressure, those are the four quantities that you'll see throughout this chapter in terms of how we deal with gases, okay? Save that one. That's, those are gases in a nutshell. So let's move on to the issue of pressure. Pretty simple stuff. You, I don't think you need to do this calculation in any of the Alex problems, but I know the textbook gives a couple and I just want you to be aware of it. Pressure, which we'll use the symbol P, capital P, is defined as the force that's applied. So we're applying a force divided by the surface area. And so I'll write this as F for force divided by A for area, force over area, okay? So what I mean by that is the following. Imagine you take a book, like a textbook, a chemistry textbook, which weigh quite a bit, right? So you got a book here, and let's say the mass is one kilogram, which is approximately 2.2 pounds. If that book is sitting on a table, it has weight. And so here's our table surface. Surface. Okay, so you got this table here. What happens when the book is sitting on the table is the book has weight. Weight is an example of a force. So the book is applying a force onto the surface of the table. So there's a force downward, right? And it's just on the surface of that table. Now, what's happening is the table is also applying an upward force onto the book, the opposite direction. So there's actually, in nature, there's never one force. There's always two. They, they occur in pairs. So the book is pushing down on the table and the table is pushing back up on the book. And if those two forces are equal, the book is stationary. Now, what happens is if the book suddenly got heavier, if it suddenly had more weight, you put another book on, now there will be more force on the table, okay? And so what'll happen is the table will actually apply a greater force onto the book. But if that force gets too large, if the book is so heavy, what happens? the table will break. So there's a limit to how much force the table can accept, okay? 
Now, the pressure is that force, the force due to the weight of the book, divided by the surface area, meaning that if you were to look at that table from the top, I'm now I'm looking down on the table, you would see that book on that table, right? So there's your table. Looking, fr looking from the top, you would see that. So what is the area? The area is the area of that book, right? There's a certain area of that book. And we call that the surface area. And so if you take that mat, I'm sorry, if you take that weight, which is the force of the book, and divide that by the surface area of the book, that's how big the book is, that ratio will give you the pressure, okay? So the pressure is the weight of the book divided by the area of the book. And that's called P for pressure. Now, suppose I did the following. Somehow I was able to take that entire book and make it into like a pencil. So here's a pencil, right? And I did the same thing. I took the table. So here's your table surface. And now I took that book and I made it the same weight, but now I turned it into a pencil. And so you had the same force, the same weight. Here's what would happen. It would be the same force, right? Weight is force. So it'd be the same force as it is here because it's the same weight. However, the area is quite a bit smaller, right? That's a small area there. It's only touching over a little tip right there. So what would happen is the force would be the same, but the area would be small. And here's what happens. When you have a very small area, if you take a large number and divide it by a small number, small number you get a large pressure pressure, okay? So the pressure is directly proportional to the force, but it also depends on the area, okay? And that's how we'll define pressure as the force divided by the area. Now, what you really need to do in this section is just do what we call pressure conversions. Pretty simple. There are different units of pressure that are used, just like there's different units of volume, different units of temperature. We'll see temperature, there's different units too. Um, so here are the typical units. The first one is called the atmosphere. That's a unit of pressure and it's abbreviated as ATM. And a unit of an atmosphere, you can think of it this way. If you're at sea level and the weather is relatively calm, there's no storms coming in, no storms going out, the pressure of the atmosphere is one ATM, one atmosphere, okay? So the standard unit would be that it, you know, typically on the surface of the earth, the pressure of the atmosphere is one atmosphere, okay? The second unit, is what's called the tor. Okay, now here's the trick about the tor. There are two ways of calling it a tor, and it's just one of these confusing things about history of science. Sometimes tor is also called millimeters, mm for millimeters, of mercury. So they're the same thing. So MMHG is just shorthand notation for millimeters of mercury. The tor and the millimeter of mercury are the same unit, okay? Now, there's a relationship. One ATM is 760. That's an exact number, by the way. It's an exact number, tor. Okay, 
And since the tor is the same as a millimeter of mercury, that means that one atmosphere also equals 760 millimeters of mercury. I'm going to abbreviate it MMHG. Okay. So that's our second unit, which has two different names, the tor and the millimeter of mercury. The third one is called the kilopascal. And one atmosphere is equal to 101 point, look how many sig figs are in this one, three, two, five kilopascal, KPA. I guess I'll put kilopascals, okay? So there are three units that I've given you here. There are other units out there, but I think these are the three that you need to know for your homework. The first one is the atmosphere, ATM. <laughs> Roughly speaking is the pressure of our atmosphere on the surface of the earth. The tor, which is also called a millimeter of mercury, and then the kilopascal, and the relationship is there's 101.325 kilopascals for every one atmosphere. So these are the conversion factors here for these problems. Those are the ones that you can use for these problems. So let me give you an example. A gas is confined to a container with a pressure of 0 0.155 atm. What is the pressure of the gas in millimeters mercury, and I'll put in parentheses, that's the same thing as a tor, right? Those are the same unit, and in kilopascals. Okay, so we're gonna do two conversions. The first one will be to millimeters of mercury or tor, and the second one will be to kilopascals, okay? So here's what you do. In the first one, you know the pressure in atmosphere. So you look and see what do you have? What did they give you? They tell you the pressure of the gas is 0.115 atm. So your units are atmospheres, right? That's our given unit. The first one we want to know is millimeters of mercury. So you look for your conversion between atm and millimeters of mercury. That's this one right here. There's 760 millimeters of mercury for every one atmosphere, okay? So you do a conversion. We wanna have it in millimeters of mercury. So we put the 760 up here and we have it in atmosphere, but we wanna get rid of the atmosphere. So we wanna get rid of this. So we put the one ATM on the bottom, the denominator. And that way the atmospheres will cancel. And that'll give us the units that we want to have, which is millimeters of mercury. So 0.155 times 760. And it looks like I get 117.8 millimeters of mercury. But let's be careful. The measurement only has three sig figs. So if you only got three sig figs there, you got to round your answer to three sig figs. So let's round it to three. One, one, this is five or greater, so we'll round that up to an eight. One, one, eight. I guess I'll put a decimal point there. Millimeters of mercury. It would also be, a, it would also be okay to say one, one, eight tor. Because remember, a millimeter of mercury is the same thing as tor. Okay. So there's your first one. The second one says we now want to have it in kilopascals. Well, here's our relationship here. One atmosphere is 101.325 kPa, okay? So we take our pressure. The given pressure was 0.155, right there. ATM, 
And now we're going to use this conversion down here. We want to have KPA. So times 101.325 KPA kilopascals over one ATM. Again, your atmospheres are going to cancel out. So it's 0.155 times 101.325, and you get 15.705 kPa, right? But again, you only have three here, only three significant digits. So we're going to round it to three. So one, two, three. So that looks like 15.7, right? The zero is five or is below five. So we'll round it down. So 15.7 kPa. And there you go. So our answers are 118 millimeters of mercury and 15.7 kPa. Okay. Any questions on that one? After all the problems you guys have done in chapter four and five, that should seem pretty simple at this stage, right? It's just really one step conversion. Okay, let's take a look here. That's good. All right. Looks like we're ready for the gas laws. Okay. So let me take a create a new whiteboard here. Oops. Let's talk about the gas laws. Um, in your textbook, this is section 10.2. Okay. There are several gas laws that problems you're going to have to go through. I'm going to go over the first one right now, which is what's called Boyle's law. And there are different ways of writing Boyle's law, but I'm going to write it this way. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. You'll see in this chapter that there's a lot of, or there's several, I shouldn't say there's a lot. There's a few of these equations that look kind of like this. P1 V1 equals P2. So let me define what we mean by this. P1 is the initial, right, at the beginning, pressure of the gas. So you have some gas in a container, that's its initial pressure. V1 is the initial volume of the gas. So the gas is, is at some, it has some space that it's occupying, some volume, okay? P2 is the final pressure of the gas. And V2, as you might imagine, is the final volume of the gas, okay? And what we're claiming here is that gases obey this very simple relationship. Okay. What it says is if you take the initial pressure of the gas and multiply it by the initial volume of the gas, that will be equal to the final pressure times the final volume. Okay. So the product of the pressure and the volume. Another way of saying this is that the product of the pressure and the volume of the gas is constant. There is one assumption in here, and, and some of the problems will give you the assumption, others will not. There's an assumption, we're assuming that the temperature of the gas doesn't change. So we say it's constant. Okay. If you don't see any temperature information in the problem, it doesn't say anything about temperature, generally you can assume the temperature is constant. But if there is, you know, if it says, look, the temperature is changing, then, then what that means is you can't use Boyle's law. So it's only valid. You can only use it if the temperature is constant. But if you're doing a problem and it doesn't say 
anything about temperature, you usually could just assume the temperature is constant, which means you can use this. Let me show you a picture of what we mean by this. This is the way that this equation is used. Imagine you've got a gas and there's a pressure pushing down. So I'll write that as P1, right? P1 is the force. You can think of it as a force, essentially, pushing down on the gas. You got the gas in here. OK. And this is your initial volume. This is V1. This is how much space the gas is taking up. OK. If you know what P1 is and you know what V1 is, you can multiply P1 times V1, right? You can multiply those two values to get the product. Now what we're claiming is we're going to change V1 into V2 and P1 into P2. We're gonna change those two values, right? P1 will change into P2 and V1 will change into V2. So now what happens is the gas occupies a different volume. So I'll make it extreme so you can really see it. Now there's a new volume, right? Now the gas is still in this container, but this, the volume is much smaller, right? So here's our V2. Okay. If that's true, if the volume changed, that means the pressure had to change too. Mathematically, that's required here. So now we have a new P, a new P, which we'll call P2. Okay. And again, if you know what these two values are, oops, let me write that a little differently. If you know what these two values are, you can calculate the product. Now, what we'll claim is that if this is the same container, it's the same gas cylinder, we haven't swapped it out and put some different gas in there or we haven't you know allowed some of it to escape or anything like that or we haven't changed the temperature what we can claim is that the product of the the volume and the pressure here pressure times volume is going to be equal to the product of the pressure and the volume there that's Boyle's law okay it's got to be equal to each other so let me show you an example of how this might work you got a cylinder filled, so a cylinder is filled with 10.0 liters of a gas. The initial pressure of the gas is 126 kPa. So notice we're using kPa for the units here. This problem could have had the pressure in atmospheres or it could have had the pressure in millimeters of mercury or tor. In this particular one, it's in kPa, which is perfectly fine. Now it says the following. The piston is pulled up. and the gas expands. Until the volume of the gas is 25.0 liters. Calculate the final pressure. of the gas. Okay, pretty straightforward. So imagine what's happening here. I'm going to erase part of that um, figure because what's happened here is not the way I drew it there. It's the opposite, right? What they're telling us is that the piston was pulled up, which means the volume of the gas is expanding. So it's got a bigger volume, right? So our V2 is now a lot bigger, or it's bigger. I shouldn't say it's necessarily a lot bigger, but it's bigger. So there's our V2, right? We've expanded the gas by pulling the piston up. 
if you've ever pumped a bicycle tire, you've done this. You, you push in, you're, you're compressing the gas. And then when you pull, usually the way these things are designed is the valve doesn't allow the gas to escape when you pull up. But if you took the valve out of the bicycle tire and you pulled up, it would actually pull gas out and it would expand. Okay, But we've expanded the gas. Remember, this is called expansion here. We learned that back in chapter five. Okay, So now here's how you approach it. You look and you know that it's a pressure volume problem, right? Because you know that they're giving you the volume at the beginning. They're giving you the volume at the end. So that means you've got V1 and V2. Then they're telling you what the initial pressure is, right? It says the initial pressure is 126 kPa. That means you got P1. And then they're asking you to calculate the final pressure. That's this one right there. So you can see everything's given in that problem setting you up to find P2, okay? So let's do the algebra first. We want P2. So if we have P1, times V1 equals P2 times V2. The way we get P2 is by dividing both sides by V2. Right, because if you divide this side by V2, you get P2. And so the way we calculate it is by taking P1 times V1 and then dividing it by V2, okay? So P2 will be P1, which is 126 kPa, times, I'll put this in parentheses just so you can see those two numbers, times V1, which is 10 liters. And then we're going to divide that by V2, which is 25.0 liters, right? P1, V1 over V2. kPa, pressure units, liters, volume units, liters volume units. Liters will cancel, so you're going to have kPa. So it looks like it's 1260 divided by 25, 50.4. And I'll point out something about this problem just so that you can kind of think about it for yourself. If a gas gets bigger, if it expands, if V2 is larger than V1, right? P2 has to be smaller than P1. And the reason for that is this equation. If I take the pressure and I make it bigger, the other one's got to get smaller because the two multiplied together have to be constant, okay? So expansion of gas will always result in lower pressure and compression of a gas, making meaning it's getting smaller, will always result in an increase in pressure. And again, think about it. If you push gas into a, um, into a container, the pressure will rise. It'll get more pressure. Same thing. If you make the gas get into a smaller container, the pressure will rise for that case. Looks like we should have three sig figs, because if you look at all the numbers that are given, they've all got three significant figures. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So 50.4 looks like a good estimate of the number of sig figs, okay? Any questions about Boyle's Law? Pretty straightforward. Okay. <clears throat> the next one is what's called Charles's Law. Again, this is still section um, 10.2, I guess. All these gas laws are in the same, connect, same um, section. So Charles's Law. This one is the relationship between volume and temperature. And the equation here is similar, but a little bit different to, than Boyle's law. It's V1 over T1, V1 over T1 equals 
V2 over T2. Okay, so remember in Boyle's law, it's multiplied, right? It's the product P times V. In Charles's law, it's the ratio, the volume divided by the temperature, okay? Um, one very important issue when you do these problems, any of the gas law problems, if you're doing temperature, the temperature cannot be in Celsius. So I'll put that here, not in degrees Celsius. It must be in Kelvin. Okay, that's an important point for temperature. Back in chapter five, when we did changes in temperature, they could be in Celsius or it could be in Kelvin. But in gas law problems, it's got to be in, um, in Kelvin. And here's why. It has to do with the nature of these temperature scales. You're all familiar with degrees Fahrenheit, I assume. At least most of you probably are, right? This is called degrees F or degrees Fahrenheit. I think they still use Fahrenheit in doctor's offices in the United States, I believe so, okay? Fahrenheit's a very old temperature scale. It came out, you know, a few hundred years ago now. And it's based essentially on water. It's based on the idea that water freezes at some value, which is 32. And water boils at 212. The Fahrenheit scale is essentially, my understanding is that it was essentially set up so that the temperature of the human body was near 100. It wasn't exactly 100, it's like 98, 99, but it's pretty close to 100. And the result of that is that water freezes at 32 and it boils at 212. We're not gonna use that scale in this course. Um, there's some problems on it in chapter one when they're teaching people how to do unit conversions, but we don't need to worry about Fahrenheit in here. The second one that is significant for us is degrees Celsius. So this is called Celsius. Some people will still, you'll see in some of the old literature, uh, centigrade. Centigrade meaning hundreds or hundred. And this is more directly based on the idea that water freezes at zero and water boils at 100. So in a way, it's a little more convenient than the Fahrenheit, except that Fahrenheit's good for temperatures of, of, of for biological temperatures because it's near 100. Um, Celsius biological temperatures are in the 30s. So it's not quite as convenient for that, but it's very convenient for water because if we're talking about a problem where water is boiling, we know the temperature is 100. And if we're looking at a problem where water is freezing, we know the temperature is zero. So it's good for that. The problem with Celsius comes about from the following issue. What happens is if you take a gas, and again, we're gonna put it in a cylinder. Let me erase that. So here's our gas confined to a cylinder. And let's make the temperature 100 degrees C. So we're gonna use the Celsius for this example. And we start cooling the gas. So suppose I cool it all the way to zero degrees C. which is the freezing point of water, right? We all know that air does not freeze at zero degrees C, right? You can still breathe the air if it's the freezing point of water, luckily, right? If air froze at zero degrees C, we'd be in big trouble in the winter time. We'd have to stay pretty much near the equator, okay? Um, so at zero degrees C, the look what happened to the gas. It got smaller, right? So as you cool the gas, the gas compresses. 
right? Cooling a gas will compress it. It will get smaller, but it doesn't go down to zero. It just gets a little smaller. So here's what happens. Suppose we cool it even further. Suppose we go down to minus 100. What you'll find is the gas will continue to compress. So we're cooling it, right? There's still some room to compress. There's still room to get smaller. The gas has gone down, but it hasn't gone down to zero volume. So we can keep cooling it and keep cooling. And it turns out at some point you'll hit a limit. At some point, the volume will reach a minimum. So we'll call this the minimum volume. And that temperature occurs at, let me write it down here, minus 273.15 degrees C. That's the temperature at which the gas will reach its minimum volume. It'll keep shrinking. It'll keep getting smaller until you get down to that temperature. Once you get down to that temperature, it will reach a minimum, okay? And so this temperature is called absolute zero. So there's two zeros, right? There's the zero where water freezes. We call that zero there. But there's another zero, which we call the absolute zero, meaning that's the real zero. Okay. And the reason for this is that, you know, when the Celsius temperature scale was developed, they arbitrarily called the freezing point of water zero. They just said, hey, let's call the freezing point of water zero. But that's not the real zero. The real zero is actually at negative 273.15. Um, sometimes it's rounded to just negative 273. Okay. So if you need three sig figs, negative 273 is fine. If you need five sig figs, negative 273.15 is fine, okay? So that's called absolute zero. And so what we do is we use that negative 273.15 in a particular way. We use what's called a Kelvin scale, which is called the absolute scale. And so absolute zero is the temperature equals zero Kelvin, okay? So if they say in a problem that it's at absolute zero, what they mean is it's at zero Kelvin. This occurs at negative 273.15 degrees C. So what we do is we now have a conversion factor between these two scales. The temperature in Kelvin, I'll put K for Kelvin, is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. And this gives us a conversion factor right here, okay? Don't need to worry about the conversion between Kelvin and Fahrenheit. It's a nice little problem to look at if you wanna do conversion problems, but we don't need it since we're not gonna deal with Fahrenheit, okay? So the point I wanna make is use Kelvin for temperature with gas problems. gas law problems, I should say. So if you're doing a gas law problem, Charles law or any of the others, make sure you're using the temperature in Kelvin. If they give you the problem in Celsius, convert it to Kelvin. Just add 273.15 and get it into Kelvin. That's the scale you want to use, okay? So let me show you an example. Charles's law. I'm going to bring it back up here. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Again, reminding ourselves the temperature should be in Kelvin, not in Celsius. So here's an example. A balloon, a weather balloon,
is filled with 22.7 liters of helium gas at sea level. Okay. The temperature is eight degrees C, kind of chilly. Eight degrees C is a little chilly, but not real cold. Okay. The balloon is moved to where the temperature is negative 36 degrees C. Calculate the new volume of the balloon. Okay, now this one, when you look at it, you might actually be able to see for yourself the problem with using Celsius. Right, because if you if you looked at if you look at this particular problem, look what would happen if you put Celsius in. You'd have to put in negative thirty six in here, and that would be kind of confusing. Like, what, what what does that mean to put in a negative number? That would give us a volume that's actually negative. It would have to be negative, so it doesn't work anyways. But um, when you do these problems, make sure it's in Kelvin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert each one. I'm going to take the first temperature. The first temperature is 8 degrees C. And I'm going to add 273. Now notice they put 270, I'm sorry, they put 8 degrees C. So when you add 273.15, you can put that in there. So is this 281? But you're not going to need that many sig figs in your final calculation because the volume's only got three. But you can leave the 0.15 in there and use it in the calculation if you want. Okay. Let's do the second one, T2, negative 36. So negative 36 plus 273.15. So that is what? Negative. So that would be 237. I think it's negative. 237.15k. Let me check that. 273.15 minus 36. Yeah, two third negative. I'm sorry, not negative. Why did I put negative? 237. There we go, right? Negative 36 plus 273 would be 237. So there's your temperatures in Kelvin. Now let's do the algebra. In this problem, they fill it with 22.7 liters. So that's our V1. That's the initial volume. You're starting at that point. Then you're starting at that point at this temperature, which is 281. Then we're going to move it to where the temperature is negative 36, which is this temperature. And now we want to calculate the new volume. This would be V2, the new volume. So let's take our equation here, V1 over T, T1, sorry, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We want to have V2. We want to have the final volume, the new volume. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take, let me rewrite it down here just so you can, so I have room to do the algebra. Gosh, why do I keep doing that? I keep calling that T2 something about the way the brain works. V1 over T1, V2 over T2. I want only V2. I want just this one. This is divided by T2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply it by T2. Because if I, if, if I divided it by T2, you'd have divide by T2, divide by T2. That'd be divided by T2 squared. So by multiplying by T2, that ratio is 1. And that gets rid of the T2. But of course, you got to multiply both sides. So I'm going to multiply this side by T2. Okay. So that means our V2 is just V1 over T1 times T2. Okay. So let me show it over here. V2 equals T2, which is 237.15K 
times V1, so let me put these in parentheses, V1 was 22.7 liters. And then we're going to divide that by T1. And T1 was 281. The units, Kelvin over Kelvin is 1. So we're only going to have liters in our units. So that's good, because that's what we wanted. We wanted to know what V was. So 237.15 times 22.7 over 281.15. I'm going to round it to three sig figs, because this one only has three. So that would be 19. 0.1 liters. And if you remember what I said when I first kind of started talking about Charles's law, I said that if you cool a gas, it gets smaller, it compresses, the volume will get smaller. So let's see what happened. We went from 8 degrees C, which is, you know, kind of chilly, all the way down to negative 36 degrees C, which is very chilly, that's very cold. So it got colder, so it should get smaller. And that's exactly what happened. It went from 22.7 liters down to 19.1 liters. It got smaller, okay? So that seems, you know, seems like it could be the right answer for that particular example, okay? Didn't change that much if you think about it. It went from 22.7 down to 19.1. That's not a huge change, even though the temperature changed quite a bit. That's a common misconception is that if you cool the gas, it compresses a lot. You really, really have to cool the gas a lot to make it change its volume a lot. Okay. And the reason for that is that the, the if you take a look at it, in terms of Kelvin, that's not that big of a change. It went from 280 down to 240 about. So to really get a gas small, you have to go really, really down. There you go. Any questions on Charles's law? Okay, so what we have left is we'll do this tomorrow. Avogadro's law. And then we'll combine these into what's called the ideal gas law. You've maybe heard of the ideal gas law. Those of you that are nursing majors and maybe have taken the Science 25 class at Kingsborough, PV equals NRT, you've seen that. Avogadro's law, that's essentially V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And then well, there's one more, which is called the combined gas law, which is P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Essentially what you're doing with that one is you're combining Boyle's law and Charles's law into one law. All of them combined together is called the ideal gas law. So we'll look at those tomorrow. Um, and then, um, you know, that, and then we'll start looking at some of the little more detailed problems where we have to do chemical reactions. We'll have some chemistry to it as well, okay? All right, you guys, um, I'll post this. It, reach out to me today if you have any questions. And exam two, I think there's only one exam I haven't graded. Um, I have one more exam to grade on exam two, but everybody else's, I think I've gone through it and looked at the problem set. So you should have an updated score for your exam two. Um, and if you're the one student that doesn't, I should get that done today for you. And lab, the second lab report should also be posted as well. And then I'll start working tonight on the third lab report. Okay. Very good. All right, you guys, have a great day. And again, reach out to me if you have any questions, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir, everybody. Thank you, Professor. Have a nice day. Again, problem. <laughs>